at your end step is brought to you by Comic Town and BCW Supplies. Hello and welcome to at your end step. My name is Morgan. I am joined with uh, joined with Mike. <laughs> no, we're not. He is not joined with me. Joined that by not, Mike. That's a real weird way to say that. Just yeah. like yeah. So uh, actually, uh, fun fact: <laughs> can join friend, twins. A now. friend of ours made a transponder teleporting machine. <laughs> we tried to go in at the same time. Very foolish. Should have watched the fly. We're now like sharing like a limb, and it's not great. It's not perfect, but here we are. I figured might as well still do a show. It's actually pretty convenient. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of always around now. <laughs> uh, I am uh, joined by Mike, uh, and um, we uh, we we just got back from Gen Con, kind of, sort of, uh, a little bit. It and, still uh, feels like I just got back from Gen Con. Oh yeah, I mean, did not fly. Felt feel like I have like a little bit of lag, though, a little jet lag. Uh, yeah, so. that's that's kind of what it is when when you get back from something as big and as um, uh, lengthy. As Gen Con, so yeah, four my, days. mine was the longest, like the longest Gen Con experience I've ever had. Was this yeah, because so. you got it on Wednesday, I got in on Saturday night, uh, not Saturday night, Friday night. Um, so mine was like one of the shorter uh, <laughs> day uh, visits I've had to Gen Con, which is it, which you know kind of made me sad. But I have a lot of other trips. Well, I have one other big trip happening, and I've had a few others this this year, so we kind of had to cut it short. But uh, I, I have to say, it was a lot of fun. And uh, we'll talk about our community, but of course we also have the Pro Tour to talk about, which happened at the same time. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff in gaming that happened over this weekend that we uh, we'll, we'll be talking about this show. So uh, let's jump right in. Uh, first and foremost, uh, our community topics, which is mainly going to be Gen Con. Now, uh, we, we both had differing times there. Uh, I know you that you actually uh, worked for one of the vendors there a couple of days as well uh, for for Brotherwise Games, notable creators of Boss Monster, uh, Unearth, uh, and their uh, new game uh, on the verge of of, of coming out. Uh, I guess not on the verge, but it's still currently being Kickstarter. It's right? currently in Kickstarter. It's uh, it's already funded, but it's they're in a bunch of stretch goals now. It's Call to Adventure. Call so to Adventure. Not not not. I don't want to sit here and be a, a corporate shill, but I will say if you like. Um, like sort of classic RPG tropes and building a character in a small gaming session. It's definitely for you. And if you like Patrick Rothfuss at all, uh, one of the first expansions that game is going to be like Name of the Wind. So that had a lot of people excited. So we're, yeah, I we're bet. checking out. And honestly, like I've gotten to work with, again, one of the brothers of Brotherwise Games now and all the conventions I've done. And I keep going back and working for them because they're just they're just good people, a pleasure to work for. And it I makes me happy whatever their games do well. So Yeah, that's great. Um, so, uh, we, we definitely had, um, a, a good time at Gen Con, though, uh, for sure. There was definitely a lot of stuff there we wanted to talk about. And, um, I, I mean, we, we got to be there for the Gen Con that was, you know, celebrating Magic's 25th birthday, which is pretty important to, you know, Mike and I, because we, we got to see some, you know, pretty, you know, you, you had the, uh, beta, you know, qualifiers for the beta draft that happened over the weekend, which was just really super cool. And I know that, uh, Mike and Justin were, were definitely... Chasing that that dream for uh, for a little bit for a little bit, um, they suckered me into doing one, and uh, I, I played a one match and lost and dropped. <laughs> uh, but I did get they have, they had very cool play mats that you you got for participating in these things. They were the the, the lotus play mats that we've seen other places. We saw them in Vegas and stuff like that, um, and they did have foil and non foil versions. Uh, which I never saw a foil version while I was there. Uh, I did. They they gave them out to the, for the top eight draft, the the, the beta draft, and those are cool looking. So. Those, those are those are very very cool looking. Um, and then uh, so I have a, a non foil version of of that uh, play mat, and you know what? That, that's pretty cool. That's a piece of history that you get to have. I mean, a lot of other people have it, but it, it's nice to to say it, that it's not that many people. Well, I will say that they ran eight qualifiers. The qualifiers had roughly 150 to 200 people in them. Uh, and they gave a few other out for different what reasons. I think they were selling some of them, but you're you're still talking about just like maybe a couple thousand. So it, it, it's unique enough that it's a it is a cool uh, trophy. Yeah. So and um, and yeah, I, I have to say like it was cool to see those. I, I do have to say that I don't remember this being a thing last year, but they were definitely cramped a little bit on on space. They had to put a pause on like on demand uh, events, which I, I can't say that I've observed hard enough to know if that was a thing that consistently happened or not um but i do know that the you know the this the 
you know, qualifiers were definitely a big draw yeah, for they, a lot of people to. W- whenever to be there. they were overlapping for like the first two rounds of another one, with an, that's when they really had to close it down. So that's when you had three to four hundred players all seated and playing. So, but you know, honestly, kudos to at pastimes. Is, it's always. I will say this. Pastime's not never going to be my favorite TO. Yeah. Uh, no. But the staff there is always great as far as like individuals, and the judge staff was yes. pretty great. So Yeah, I agree with that. Um, the company as a whole may not be my favorite, but I've never had a, a bad experience with the uh, people there at Gen Con. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, will, I will have to personally say. I can't speak for Mike, but I will have to personally <laughs> no, say. I, I, yeah, I agree with that. So. Um, but uh, I know that uh, before I got there, you actually had an interview with, uh, Watsi's own Drew uh, Nolasco over not Magic, uh, but actually the Transformers uh, TCG that they are releasing here in uh, September, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, d- dear listeners, before I, I go off this, I will tell you that I got the email from them uh, through having a, a press badge, and <clears throat> I was like, okay, well, I, I'm interested in this. I'm also interested in seeing if I can, you know, just get a chance to talk to a Watsi rep because I do Magic. Um, so I, I went in there being like, oh, I'm going to listen to this. And I, I will say, uh, actually, I went and Jordan, who former uh, you know, host of the show, also went and, and interviewed with me. And then we both turned around and bought the starter immediately after. So we went in like skeptical, like, oh, well, let's see what we're doing. And then like they just had our money. It was weird. But uh, yeah, Drew Nolasco is the guy who was actually uh, the, the, the lead design for the Transformers card game that's coming out. It said it's September 28th. They had um, starter decks at Gen Con and some promo stuff. And I have to say, I really enjoyed it. Now, and I and I taught Morgan it too. And uh, about three or four turns into the game, Morgan goes, "Yeah, I'm about this game." <laughs> so, um, it, it, it's really focused. If you play any sort of miniature game, you, you, you'll know sort of the concept of like building a team based on a, of a rating. In this case, you're building a team of uh, transformers based on a star rating the cards have. The cards themselves are oversized, so think like oversized commanders or the special cards like that we got from. You know, the Avacyn Restored pre-release, like those kind of cards. If you have oversized 8th edition cards like I have. Uh, those are bigger than that. Are they bigger than that? I guess yeah. I never compared. Over, oversized, like, oversized generally means 3x5. The ones from 8th, 8th edition, the special ones you have are bigger than that. Oh, fair enough. I've so, never, like, held a I commander know. card. You, you, hate, you hate them. I know I know you hate the ones that you got. <laughs> I, I do have one, uh, was it Ambition's Cost? Is that the... the, the... Uh, black uh, yeah, yeah, draw yeah. spell. I do like that art because it's the uh, Three Kingdoms art, mm, nice. uh, and it's very it's very nice art. Uh, but the rest of them are complete and utter garbage, <laughs> and I don't know why they own them. I should check their prices. Actually, I don't actually know if they're worth anything. So they might be, and I might just be complaining about having free money, <laughs> and then I'd look dumb. Uh, would be the first time. Anyways, uh, so, so but the game focuses on like you building your team of transformers, and then they of course can uh, they they have a, a, the, the convert mechanic, which is where you flip them from you know car mode to bot mode against alt mode is what they call it mm-hmm. you can do that once per turn and then you get to attack each other um they do you if you're a magic player they use some common phrases like tap and untap which is cool but the difference here is like you attack with one character each turn and you can only attack another tapped character unless like there's no tapped characters and then no characters untap until all of them are tapped so it is this weird like domino effect of like you deciding what order to attack in and then what mode you want your transformer to be in when they attack or when they receive damage when they defend um so you attack specific you know, specific bots not the player and then you win or lose but you know, if you lose all your bots then that's it uh and honestly it plays pretty well there's a really really simplified mode for kids and uh, Drew was very excited to tell us, like, he, the whole point was that, you know, he, he's, a, he's a guy who grew up liking Transformers and then wants to teach his children. And then you can do that. Um, I think what's really nice about it, though, is that the oversized cards, I think, when I first looked at them, I was like, ah, okay, whatever. But, like, the point of the game is the Transformers themselves. So those being this large physical presence uh, actually is pretty interesting. It makes for some, you know, cool, and, like, the as you're playing, the converting and the flipping them over, like, really does, like feel i want to say like as like a tactile feeling for playing a game it makes like sense yeah and like the uh, the card the, the art looks really good it's it's yeah. it's taken from uh it, it they, they've used some of the art from the so the the, the small not like, the oversized guys they're yeah, smaller the, deck cards the cards that make about. up their their deck uh which yeah i won't get into like specific stuff there but the, the decks have a have a dual purpose there's a mechanic for like 
adding equipment essentially to your transformers, uh, and there's like some spell effects. But they all, all the cards themselves also flip when you attack. That's where you get some variance in the game. Uh, and all that art is, yeah, IDW um, uh, Transformers comics. comics. Yeah, th those are really cool. They look really great. The actual oversized cards have beautiful art as well. Uh, typically, they have like uh, a foiling process on them. Yeah, one the the robot side is yeah. is foil. And um, if you're a fan, uh, if you grew up uh, with with Transformers, which I say that I did, but it was definitely like I, I grew up with it after it had, like stopped being on TV. You know, I watched like uh, uh, you know like video videos yeah, of it and stuff sure, like that sure. like uh but i was it was gone i was born 88 so it was it was not necessarily if it was airing on tv i was not old enough uh, to i perceive. i just think they were watching the beast wars version of it which oh is like, yes yeah yeah if, oh my gosh please <laughs> please do like realistic art artistic interpretations of the god awful cg that was beast wars <laughs> it was definitely ahead of its time for when it was done but go look at it's no, it's, it's it's bad it's like the, with that that show and reboot in the 90s where oh like, yeah oh, i get it <laughs> uh, this is advanced but to be fair they could show up the dinobots are already part of this and, yeah. and um i i think when we asked him you know i specifically asked him you know like how would you know that we see how the game was top down the cards literally flip <laughs> like uh but like what else could like you do and if you are a person we have some good friends of the show who are huge transformers like lore junkies like i am for magic and i asked him like how does that interpret and he started like listing characters who are in this first set who are the deepest of deep cuts and i i think that if you're if you're listening to this right now and you're like i like transformers or i like this you're probably gonna like this game i agree and if you also just like magic it's a good chance you probably still just like this game yeah so. I, I, I would i would say give it a shot uh, when you can um yeah. and and don't be uh don't be closed off from it because it's not an ip that like watsi has made itself that it, they're they're like and this is like another sort of like pokemon that they 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 started or another like harry potter thing right uh, there's another property they're preventing a game for. The game's good. The game is solid, uh, in that it, and it still is flavorful with the IP that they have, which is a pretty much a, a you know peanut butter jelly sort of situation. Right. Fun fact: they also probably won't lose that IP for any reason because it's Hasbro's IP. That's that's very true as well, <laughs> uh, which is so. a smart move uh, on them. Uh, and I'm, I'm I'm excited. I want to see more cards. I want to you know see what to, what what to really do with it. And um, uh, I I know that it's probably going to be something that is you know a, a small thing that maybe we we you know do casually. Uh, but it, it's still going to be a fun thing to explore. And one of the coolest things that we got to experience early at Gen Con. Yeah, it was it, you should, the lines every morning to try and buy the cards or in the lines to demo it were obscene. Were obscene. So I'm glad I got a chance to do that and it was like one of those it's one of those like little things where it's like okay, I got to do this and now I feel like, you know, getting a little bit early. So when when you get a chance to play it, try doing it. Um speaking of other games though by made by Watsi, I want to talk about Harry Potter for just a minute. Yeah, of course. So you, those of you who've listened for a while know that I really do enjoy the Harry Potter game that wow or that wow the Watsi used to make. Um and I say used to, like, I think the last set was 2004, but used to. Uh, it's fine. Uh, and their normal championship event happened the, this weekend at Gen Con. I didn't play in it this year, sadly. Um, I That's because I was trying very hard to qualify for those, in those birthday qualifiers, so sad times for that. But I did go over and see them, and, uh, the, you know, the group, the it's now called the uh, Harry Potter TCG Revival. Uh, they, they've got a lot of people... And I want to say worldwide, like there's a lot of people in Europe who are all about this too. And then this year, because Matt or because like Wizards had such a presence at Gen Con, Elaine Chase was there, and she heard like if you if you saw on Twitter, she heard that there was a championship event. She came and watched the finals of that. And, and Elaine Chase, who now serves, she's like the VP of marketing or something. Mm -hmm. Is her? She was the head for the Harry Potter game, so she was like, I need to go check on my baby. And I'm yeah. like, that's so I, I think that's pretty cool to see like. <laughs> And I, I know that that game is now you have people who are coming together and they're probably going to try and make their own you know, fan sets, which is what happens for a lot of dead games. But mm. um, I think that was really cool that like, you know, especially the guy who uh, you know, he's based out of Chicago, who's sort of been like the head for all this to have that moment where like the person who invented the game to come over and be like, wow, this is still a thing. And it's like, sure is. And just be like, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like i uh, i uh, last year when, when mike was doing uh the the you know playing in that uh championship uh it was definitely something that i like hung out and watched and like the game is really cool and like we we played it a little, maybe like once actually but like watching people play it who are passionate about it are at like the 
the top of the you know <laughs> this is this is essentially you know the the pro tour of the Harry Potter yep. TCG. When watching people who are really passionate about something play something that they're they're good at is is always cool to see. And um, being a big Harry Potter fan myself, I'm like, oh man, I wonder how expensive it would be to like build decks in this. It's just like it's untenable. I, I have a lot of cards. It's okay. Yeah, it, but it's like, come on. I, I have cube updates though, so we can do that. We haven't done that since last year. So the the uh, bust out the cube and, yeah. and try that out. Yeah, so. that, could, that could be fun. Uh, any other games that uh, you saw that you wanted to uh, to talk about that you saw at Gen Con? Um, anything that was like new and sort of big. I, I, there's a couple of games I wanted to try. We played Legendary, which I know isn't new, but I did mm-hmm. enjoy that as a deck building game. Yeah. Um, I still want to try. There's a Disney game called Villainous. I wanted to try it. Or yeah, Villainous. I didn't get to, but I want to. Um, I will say this. A uh, shout out to Cards Against Humanity, who was there. Uh, they had a special um, pack for Gen Con, which they normally do. It was pretty politically slanted, and it was, it was, it, as a joke to buy, was amazing because it was just like this list of like depressing things, and then the last card in the pack was like, <laughs> like not like not like unuseful political satires or ineffective political satire, and it was just like. Ooh, <laughs> but they actually were registering people to vote. They the were whole, the main point of their entire booth was to register people to vote, mm-hmm. and I thought that was awesome. I, I got a pin from them the first day that said like I you'll register to vote here, and like I don't they, they give a lot of pins. People want you to wear their advertisements for them. That's the only one I wore <laughs> like all weekend. It's just like you know what, yeah. go vote, go vote. It was go it, was, it was very cool. It was very uh, nice to see. They had really good uh, like a. a, a really well picked booth because the booth was actually in front of where you would enter into the uh, exhibit hall from the TCG hall right. or the gaming hall they got, so they got kind of both sets of traffic yeah. so yeah i agree so that that was cool i thought that that was definitely worth mentioning as far as you know the, those sorts of things um like I said, we got to celebrate Magic's birthday. We got a bunch of cupcakes. Uh, yep. We tweeted out some pictures of those delicious cupcakes. Yeah, they were they were quite tasty. I only had one. I didn't want to eat any more than one, but they were very good. I I don't, can't count how many I had. <laughs> it's Cause, too many because I I played the three of the qualifiers and I think I had at least two during each qualifier because like there were extras. Yeah, and then like. Some of the judges were just walking around with extra ones, and I definitely ate some of those, too. I'm fat. I don't know what to tell you guys. I got to eat a bunch of birthday cupcakes, so happy birthday to Magic, and happy birthday. <laughs> to you. Happy death day to my cholesterol. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but that was cool, and then mm-hmm. so we got to watch some of the beta draft, which was cool. Yeah, we. Uh, I was uh, hit or miss on actually watching packs open, get opened, because I was... Pick, it was Sunday, so I was picking up like sort of the last things that I wanted to get from the, uh, from the vendor hall, uh, but I did know that... Uh, at least three beta bolts were, were open. There was a Bayou and a what jet? A uh, there's a Mach jet. jet. There's a tropical island and a Mana Vault. Oh, Mana Vault was the other big so, one. Yeah. And I think we do have to have a shout out here though because uh, a, a person, you know, personal uh, friend from the area. He, he's he's since moved to Minnesota, but uh, his name's Dewitt. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I won't give a last name just just in case, but uh, he actually won one of those drafts. And uh, got to got to we got one of the slots in the draft and got to draft and he uh, I know I know the nicest thing he got was a demonic tutor which is still nice pretty for solid. A beta and I got to watch him play his top eight match his opponent definitely locked him out hard with pestilence across multiple games but they did draw a game because he was under the pestilence lock and drew a hurricane and was able to draw the game by killing them both so that was. Pretty great, but uh, actually, Devin Kepke is the yep. one who won the overall thing. Yeah, so, won the alpha alpha starter. starter. Yep, uh, sealed alpha starter and uh, a cash prize, which, uh, as players in the top eight draft were told, uh, literally exists just to pay the taxes on <laughs> whatever you do with the alpha starter. Correct. <laughs> Which is wild. Yeah, so, but it was really cool to be there. We were in line, actually, for more Transformers cards Sunday, and I was watching up my phone, and then they had a TV set up, and I was a little bit behind the TV, so the people who were 30 feet from me cheering, I was like, oh, okay, cool, something good's about to be open. Right, which exactly. Was, which is pretty cool. Um, but, you know, no, uh, no, no time walks, no, like, mox sapphires or anything like that, but still... You know, if you if you're lucky enough person to open that mox jet, you're probably pretty happy. Yeah, I mean, like I think like that, again, like basically lands that or the point, trop, or twenty heck. bucks. So like, you were probably fine for that, anyways. But yeah, the trop's gorgeous yeah. too. And then you also had some Watsy employees who were there. Who we we got to talk to Mark Purvis, for example. Yep. Um, and Aaron Forsyth was there uh, Sunday during mm-hmm. that, and he might have been there other times. Trick Jarrett was there playing a lot of EDH games, and they were sort of walking around like on Sunday and, and at other points during the weekend, and just had packs of like legends. Or, like, the dark, and we're adding them to drafts. Uh, Morgan and I did a two out of giant draft on Sunday, and the one that fired after us 
had a Legends know, pack. They had Legends pack open, but I guess they did that earlier in the weekend too. There was a double Caracas pack opened in, in one of those drafts, and so like they they you know they were just like drafting in their pack. It's like oh, there's two of these, so that's weird, but we'll, we'll take this. So. Um, that was just cool. It did feel, you know, I, I, I've said before in here, I was frustrated with like how origins just sort of ignored. I was glad to see the Gen Con, like they really, again, there was a lot of like, I think Wilson yeah. Totoro was also there. Yep. Obviously said Elaine Chase was there. Just having a lot of like, there was a Wizards panel on the, on that Friday. Just a lot more, I don't know, it was, it was great. And it, you know, we, they, they had a good presence in the hall of grades and they may, may have needed more space, but they also had like a really good testing area set up a little bit outside, which was like their own like dominated area where they had transformers and magic. And that place was rocking mm -hmm. the entire time. So it was a good showing, I think, and a kind of fun to, you know, just to be around it. Hey, I'm just glad that we got some more MNT Manowar elves out into the wild. So we can really drop the price <laughs> of that card. It's not going to drop the price, but I think it's actually normalized. I think I think at this point in time it has, but was it like eight bucks or something? Like I have that? no idea. If you don't know the the the, the M19 like Lenore was for the longest time was like I don't know. When, since the first oh, you're not talking about the promo. Some of them talking about the, the no, 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 oh, no, yeah, yeah, the, no, the, the M19 the Lenore. It's, <laughs> it's in the intro deck, and there are a ton of them <laughs> opened and played with because there's a lot of like intro, teaching, yeah, 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 teaching people magic, and that's what they use. They use those intro decks to do that. So. I'm just glad more of those got sent to the wild so we can finally, you know, lower the price of, uh, of <laughs> don't buy M19 Lanner Oops, come on. They're, come on. I mean, in, in a world of a million Lanner Oops, you got to find the one that's the most unique and hilariously that outside of, like, beta. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's true. There you go, so... Uh, but yeah, uh, Gen Con was really fun. Again, if it's you know something you haven't gone to before, and it, it, it's worth it, it hundred it, percent it is. There is so much to do, uh, and if you are, uh, even if if the only thing you want to do is play Magic, guess what? You could do that for forever, An infinite amount of time, forever there. Um, and if you like other games and like, I, I really enjoy, uh, I, I really tried to pay attention to some of the exclusives that they had because I, I definitely wanted to like, if I'm going to be here, I want to take advantage of me being present yeah, here absolutely. and like get some of these exclusives. Like, uh, I know that it clank, which is a uh, dire wolf, uh, um, uh, game, you know, where you know, a lot of magic players work. Uh, they had a, a exclusive expansion that was going to be released early there. And I was like, I want that. I have clank. I really enjoy playing it. Uh, even though I don't get to play it as much, but like getting your hands on an you know expansion for it early is awesome. So, uh, but yeah, uh, I would encourage everyone to to definitely go. It's 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 great. I think I'll like just even piggybacking on that because I, I totally agree and like getting to see what like people do like you know I I don't play a lot of um, like Blizzard games anymore. I mean the Blizzard booth was was rocking and they had such a cool setup like you know like. Like like a Hearthstone like tavern setup and like all this stuff. I I bought Overwatch playing cards because it was cool. But like their presence was immediately noticeable. Yeah. And um, I also think it brings just some cool people out of the woodwork. You know, specifically talking about Magic. Like I lost one of my qualifiers to uh, Ben Lundquist, uh, aka Benny Beatdown. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was like, man, I remember this name. And like I was talking to him a little bit. He's like, yeah, it's I've been out of for a little while, but I did this and this. Like, oh yeah. And then I don't even, I don't even, still don't even know who it was. But the guy next to me, he's like, but I don't have any Pro Tour tape. It's how many did you have two and the guy next to me goes like nah i just have the one and i was like i don't even know what's going on here and I, so i literally said i want an open does that count and the guy looked at me the guy who had a, a top of the pros are goes everybody's on an open man i was like you're right you're right <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so, but it was just like, just like a lot of, you know, obviously there's a lot of people at the Pro Tour, which we're going to talk about, but like people come out like to, those people are out there for the birthday qualifier, but like the Harry Potter game, like there's a bunch of people I've met now because that, and that's, that's when they get a chance to get together and you can really, there's a bunch of friends who I know that you and your wife have made, Morgan, yep. who, that's where you get to see them. Yeah, and, they're, and, they're Gen Con friends and uh, we, we keep like uh, tacit like contact with them in, uh, you know, between Gen Cons, but we know that's where we're going to see them, so... It's uh, it's a a good time, and you're you're among, uh, you're really a, a, among people that are that that get get you, uh, if you're a gamer, uh, if you're like a tabletop gamer and RPG person, like you're you're around your people. It feels like <laughs> it, it's a very uh very you know inclusive place to be, and I, true, and like it's I don't like to play games with like random people that often. Like I I, I want to know a little bit, but like this year we even did some stuff we hadn't done before. Like I I demoed a lot more games. And uh, we we stayed up two nights in a row to like one two in the morning playing uh, Secret Hitler with some mm -hmm. random people and just kind of had a blast just like just sitting there and doing that and I, and it's just like there's not a lot of places where you could just sit down at a table and know that nine other people are going to sit down with you 
we're just gonna play this game. It's yeah. gonna be fun. So it's a it's a great experience. Um, but yeah, I mean that that that's that's Gen Con in a nutshell. Um, the only other community topic that we wanted to uh, to really discuss, and uh, this was kind of touchy. Uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you. We'll probably be a little bit uh, light with it in general. Uh, but uh, uh, the Vorthos Cast, another podcast that we kind of you know made a shout out to here and there uh, on our, on our show because they do a really good job. Oh, not just shout out. I I love the Vorthos Cast. Yes, uh, but they do an, an amazing job with the story aspects of Magic the Gathering. And um, uh, Mike and I are uh, are both of varying levels of interest in that as, as far as that goes. But one of their uh, hosts, uh, Carrie, I forget their I'm not, last name. I'm not name. sure their last name. Uh, but Carrie is going to be uh, leaving due to sort of a situation uh, involving, um, uh, partly due to this at the very least, partly due, due more to... like a, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yes, yeah. But it's uh, a weird straw. Yeah, due to a situation that involves uh, a uh, recent hire uh, by Watsi. Yeah, so uh, the hiring was, and it's like the senior creative narrative uh, like leader. And I, 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 I had the exact title. I've got to pull pull it up. Uh, it's Nick Nick Kelman was the hire. Nick Kelman. Uh, basically, there are uh, some things that this person has. Uh, uh, written and published that you can obviously, you know, still find and, and even purchase uh, that are of a questionable uh, uh, questionable subject matter a uh, yeah, but to, 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 to say, you know, to put it lightly, I would say yeah. it's, it's definitely uh, something that is uh, not something you would think a company associated with Hasbro, uh, to, to be perfectly honest, would want you know, their brand to be associated with uh, senior franchise narrative designer. That's yes. the actual title. Um, now, obviously, uh, uh, you know this is something that I, I know that we had you know just heard about and found out. I just heard about it today. Uh, I know that you listened to the, the yeah. The we tr I tried to do a little bit of research onto it, and like I, the thing that you know Carrie was frustrated about is that the the people that sort of did, and again this we say discovered this like if you if you search you know his name like it's like the first thing that pops up because it's things that he's written like and it's not just like blog writings or books that were released yeah. um so when they've reached out to watsi about it they've been sort of stonewalled silence has come back and obviously like this person watsi is not the only company this person has worked for i believe they worked for marvel for a while and a couple other places so you know it, it is just it's just odd you know, that watsi you know, has pushed you know whenever watsi pushes the message at least outwardly of you know like ally status inclusivity all these things and then like just ignores when people ask a question, like at least give an answer. You know what I mean? We're, we're in a touchy time, you know, time period of that anyways, obviously with like things like, like the James gun firing mm -hmm. and these sorts of things. Um, but it's always weird when Watsi is very quick to be like, yeah, this is who we are. And then it's like, okay, well, can I ask you a question about this? And they're like, what, what about what? I don't, I don't see what you're, what the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll call you later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, needless to say, it, it's something that it can, it can be pretty troubling to certain, uh, you know, uh, portions of the demographic that that, that uh, sh should be perfectly comfortable, you know, uh, playing Magic and supporting Wizards of the Coast as a company. It's certainly, it, the, the again, the previous writings may do nothing, you know, again, some of these are older. Yo, but again, again, I mentioned the James Gunn because it does feel like a fairly apt comparison to me, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it is odd because it it opens a question to where does where who, how do I phrase like how does Magic Story get steered from here because that's that's it's just odd and of course it could mean nothing with that but I think that you know you know Carrie's point and why you know, he you know, they're they're quitting Magic. Like it, they're just like in yes. entirely, um, and, and not just because of this, but because this is again, this is just a weird thing that happens where it's like, okay, give just give us a reason, acknowledge that you know this exists because there's so many things in the, you know in the last few years we can point to a magic where they just ignore it for a little bit and then it's like, oh well, we heard you. It's like, but yeah, but like we don't, we could like just do any amount of research first, right. Like, we figured this out. And, like, uh, to, to be honest, you know, I didn't really even know that this was going on until it was brought up by the, the Vorthos cast. Yeah, but... and, and not not even every member of that show did, because there's definitely an interview with the, the, the Jay and Ellie had done you know, with that person. Now, granted, that, that he's not... Jay is not a person who was trying to hire him. So, like, yeah. you know, would, why wouldn't you assume that the company that is, is okaying the interview 
has done the vetting. You know what I mean? That's right. the thing. But like, so so it, it's it maybe I, I don't know what it makes it stand, but it's a weird thing and it's something to be aware of. If you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Wazi does finally make some sort of like statement about it, say some sort of response. But uh, on a personal level, it's just frustrating because like I hate to see a voice in the community that I really really enjoy uh, leave. Yeah. I completely agree with that, and you know we we've, we've seen that before with you know different situations, obviously. But um, it, this is something that uh, Watsi I think ha- directly has to answer for in, in some facet. They, I, I think like the 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 you know excerpts that were shared with me from the 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 books that this person has uh, written were they they were not appropriate. There. Again, I'm going to keep using a, a generic word over here, but it's, like, weird. I just yeah. don't... Like, certainly, uh, I, the word I would use, erotic fiction, in general, is not a genre that apply, like that appeals to me, but that is weird for that. Like, <laughs> like again, I'm just going to be vague. I'm not gonna, like not trying to, like, if you want to go and look, that's fine. Just know that it's creepy and weird. Yeah. And I, I think that a lot of people need to, to know about it, because I think a lot of people don't. Yeah. Uh, Obviously. It, it would it should be something that is, is brought up to to it's a lot to buy more people yeah. to be perfectly honest so we're doing our part trying to get the word out uh but that is everything for our community topics uh before we jump into our competitive segment we do want to give a quick shout out to comic town our lovely sponsor uh they are going to uh be having a modern star city games uh invitational qualifier uh with a prize payout of 1k in oh is that is that cash that's like, that's yeah, a, yeah, that's a, that's an IQ. That's the cash. That's the cash. That's some money. That's some cold hard cash right into your pocket, and it's going to be on Saturday, August eighteenth. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe there is a uh, modern deck that caught your eye, the Pro Tour that you want to really, uh, you know, kick the wheels on, and uh, this will be the the perfect opportunity for you to uh, to do that. <laughs> maybe you've taken up a new instrument, um, like maybe like a trumpet, a recorder, a bugle, a, maybe. A bu- maybe, maybe a bugle. That's... Maybe you want to you know, call the, uh, the the townspeople. <laughs> and uh, this is going to be your, your avenue to do that. I, I know how annoying it would get, but I would love for someone to just sit down, bring a, a bugle with them, and every time they play a bugle, just like, and just put it down, and like never stop making eye contact, but act like it was like not a thing. Just like, can you stop doing that? Doing what? I was just <laughs> doing what? I just cast. A I card. was just announcing. I was just. I was just casting a spell. This is part. I was just resolving a <laughs> trigger. Casting cost. <laughs> I was just resolving my trigger. Oh my what are you gosh. talking about? Uh, yeah, you just got to keep doing it while you're looking at the top four. <laughs> um. Anyway. So, let's talk about the Pro Tour. No. Let's not talk about the Pro Tour. Not yet. Okay. Uh, one more thing I want to mention. Okay. I want to mention, uh, shout out to BCW Supplies. Okay. I got to go to their, uh, sort of like, their little shindig in Gen Con this year, which Morgan got to go to last year, and I didn't, did. and I was sad. So we switched spots. So we switched spots. Maybe places. next year we'll both get to go. It, it'll be, but I want to say, uh, it was really, really nice and very cool, and their, their presence at, at all the cons has always been great. I went to them about oversized stuff because of Transformers, and, and they were like, no one told us to bring that. I was like, well, bring it next time. <laughs> uh, but they had, you know, they had it, and it was just, it was very nice and getting to see some of the, the new material and how much they really do care about um like obviously you know, we have had uh, you know a, a business relationship with them yep. but like the individuals who like you know who represent that that company have always just been very very nice and very just like like sort of straightforward like oh you is this something you want we can work on making that and i think for a pretty large supply company to have that sort of personal touch like go and talk to them at one of these cons go go and, and see their rep when they come to your store they're going to make that connection with you, and I think that's very cool. Yeah, I can't can't speak highly of, of them enough. Uh, we we don't really have like an, an official sponsorship with them, but they're like they they they're still in the run of our show because we still want to drive business yeah one hundred percent business to them because they're good people. Um, and if you haven't checked out, you know some of the new stuff they have. I know I, I believe they have some new like colors and and uh, the, like uh, actual uh, finishes. Is what I'm looking for for their uh, deck art elites, which are still great sleeves. If you haven't tried them yet, I, I had some few people ask me. I was playing the the one of the modern events, and people asked me what kind of sleeves they were. So I got to like you know. Tell him about the seeing the yeah it was weird. Morgan was like, "Oh, these sleeves, they're BCW," <laughs> yeah. and he's like shouted it real loud. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone in the vendor hall, you know, they they could hear me, you know. And then he played his bugle. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, that definitely you know uh, can't can't sing their praises enough, and we can say that honestly because they're really not our, our sponsor anymore uh, at this point in time. Uh, but we still one hundred percent support them personally. Yeah. Uh, so, 
I hope you guys heard my under the table clap for yeah, the Pro I don't Tour. Know, he was like he was getting himself ready, guys. <laughs> gotta gotta wake myself up. <laughs> so the the Pro Tour was the 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 team Pro Tour. So it was all constructed all the time, three different formats, and then the the finals were on Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we got some interesting things from this. We got all the deck lists from all the teams yeah, that like were in the, the Pro Tour. That, like, I, I made an offhand joke about that when we were talking about like what kind of... Because like, uh, as of Saturday or as of Saturday night, they'd only shown us the top four deck lists. We had a few others we had seen via some deck techs. Uh, MTG Goldfish does a good job compiling those. But I was like, man, I wonder what we'll get. And Because uh, like, records are a little wonky with your know, teams. Obviously. Because um, you, you don't really know a true sort of record of each individual uh, uh, yeah. deck right like uh, you know any, honestly even the decks in the top four one of them could have done pretty poorly it is, it's hard to tell but i will say that so i i, I told morgan jokingly i was like it's like well there weren't that many teams let's just print all of them let's print all of them. next day it was like they did here's all the decks it's like nice <laughs> uh, so like you know this is going to be something that we're going to really talk about like what was the you know best deck in each format or anything like that uh, i think it's important to talk about um you know, uh, something uh, particular about standard uh, that that is. We're, I think we're going to save a full discussion for that. We are. But we he's are. Talking but we get, with the turbo fog. Deck. We are going to get talk about turbo fog. Which, if you've paid attention to Twitter, Morgan's been a real busy guy. <sighs> he's just calling out hot takes left and right, and I and I got to say, I, I I agree with him. So so um, so I don't really know how to talk about uh, the actual decks, but I can talk about uh, the presentation and the coverage, and it was definitely I think a challenge for for them this year. Um, just for the sheer fact of organizing this, this sort of, uh, team and presenting it fluid, uh, fluidly, uh, with also the presentation quality that they like to have with the Pro Tour. Because, you know, we have the, the, the team events that Star City Games has, and typically, uh, you know, the, every, everything is sort of laid out and, um, that you have the teams all sitting kind of close to each other. This one, every, um, uh, you know, match was going on at a, a completely separate table. And uh, there was only one, you know, match really, you know, going on. So there's three games of, of you know, magic going on uh, at the same time for the most part. Uh, but only there wasn't like a backup match they could really get to until later on. I think they tried to start trying to implement that later on or something like that. Um, so uh, sometimes you just had a lot of dead air. You had you had a lot of filler, uh, you know. Uh, as we have consistently made fun of Watsy for dun 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 dun, dun team teams. names, <laughs> and well, the best part is like that joke's even better because it was like teams, and then which teams team, were those teams yeah, apart? Teams on teams on teams. <laughs> so it was, was team exhibit. It was hey, I heard you like teams, so we put a team in your team. <laughs> Well, we so broke, you could team while you team. We broke up your teams into teams, so you <laughs> could like team, team while you team. team. Yes, correct. And uh, I, you know that's just that's just something that they don't necessarily seem focused on uh, fixing. Uh, and uh, obviously, with going back to a regular sort of uh, pro tour for the next time, you know we'll we'll kind of get what we get. But I don't think they're gonna. I, I don't know if they've come up with a good solution for their dead air problem. Yeah, I I think that there's some things they could have done, but obviously they still have to fit within. I think they could have done a little bit more Sunday as far as, like, holding matches, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, because, like, the, the top eight was done, including, like, a lunch break by what? It was, we were driving home, it was, like, 5, 30, 6 o'clock, something like that. I'm not saying it should go until 8 or 9 at night or anything no. like that, but they, they could have held some more matches, and I do think that, that that's hard to do during the regular rounds, um, but the fact that you had zero, zero backup matches at all, it just seems like a weird bit of planning because I, I made mention of it now granted i was at gen con so was morgan so our, our watching of it at least, well, at least morgan was for most of it. i was trying to watch it in between rounds on my own playing but i started getting this idea i was like man there's never any, never a turn you know and i had i had twitter settings set to like let me know when rounds were firing like i was i was for it and then i started seeing a couple other like fairly prominent names uh, on on twitter being like hey are there just like not a lot of matches here and i was like okay i'm not insane so I, I really wish, um, you know, we talk about, like, again, like, Channel Fireball has done such a good job, I think, of, you know, with the idea of, like, fast matches and just going back and showing those recorded, uh, what do they call them? A time walk. Time walk, yeah. Like, I, I just wish we had something at all like that because there were so many, one, exciting teams. Like, players, Blast from the Past, all teaming together. Uh, 
I just like seeing it was exciting and I'm just sad we didn't get to see more matches out of it. So I also think as far as like how they chose, I know we had some, you know, Dave, you know, former, former host, uh, had some frustration with the choices of, um, like matches they were picking and then like this, what decks they were focusing on. I know that throughout the entire tournament standard definitely sort of got, uh, the short shrift, which is probably okay. Uh, we're going to look at the metagame breakdowns and standard, standard had a problem, <laughs> but, uh, I think that, you know, having some backup matches helps with that a little bit. And again, like holding matches, maybe, you know, holding the camera for that. I, obviously, the, the ability to talk, the, you know, to each other changes the team structure a little bit as far as recording matches. But I I, I hope that if, they, if we get something like this again in the future, which they had some 30k viewership spikes throughout the PT, they did, they did okay, we might see this again. Um, and I think, honestly, Legacy was a bit of a hit. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be kind of honest. Like Legacy seemed to be pretty popular. Um, you know, being such a rarity on the Pro Tour is probably a big part of that. But I, I think it's, I, I think we'll see this again, and I hope they sort of can reconsider how they do some of that coverage. I mean, I, I think Legacy. I agree. Legacy was definitely uh, a big hit because you had some of the, you know, you had some of the best players playing Legacy. Um, that we don't typically see. They don't come to, you know, you're not, you're not seeing these players uh, you're grinding the Star City tournament right, anymore. Right, exactly. They are GP players and, and, you know, Pro Tour players, and we don't get that many Legacy GPs. So it was exciting to see it on the biggest stage. Uh, you also got to see masters of Legacy that do not get to show their skills anywhere else that were added onto teams specifically because they because are of Legacy, Legacy experts. And I think they did a good job of highlighting those people because they were on teams where you may be new to the players, but you didn't <laughs> know the legacy. The third, yeah. And you're like, this is who this person is. Or like, um, uh, I believe it was Pascal uh, Maynard was playing legacy to, on his team. And he was talking about, he was playing red, black reanimator. So he like talked to the person on magic online who was like the trophy leader. And they were, they played red, black reanimator. And he got to learn all of the tips from that person. And he talked about his experience with that. And it's like, you don't get those stories with other formats because legacy is so unique and being like narrow. Yeah. Uh, and you, you have these experts that are only that necessarily, they're only experts in legacy, but they're primarily <laughs> known for being less experts in legacy who get to show off their uh, expertise in sort of the, the biggest stage. Yeah. And I, I think on top of that too, legacy sort of benefited from being a, uh, um, a, a fresher format, if that makes sense. But recent, yeah, recent banning opened it up. I mean, or uh, recent banning like opened it up a little bit, and I think you you saw that as as sort of a result. So I think that's it's kind of interesting. Uh, do you want do you want to take a look at the metagame breakdowns, uh, and then we can look maybe at a couple of specific decks. Sure. Uh, so let's start with the standard metagame breakdown. Standard had a bit of a problem, and I'm I'm interested to see. We have two standard GPs this weekend, both in Brussels and in Orlando, and I want to know what standard looks like. Now, granted, this is a team event, so the choices could just be like, this is how this deck plays you know, on this team, whatever, but there were 66 copies of Red Black Aggro in standard. That's 40% of the overall metagame. So you're over, over a third of the metagame was one deck. Then you had Steel Leaf Stumpy with 31 copies, 18% of the field. Grixis Midrange with 13 copies, seven, you know, almost 8% of the metagame. Reservoir Combo had a strong showing with 9 copies, 6 6 percent, or sorry, 5 and a half ish percent of the, the metagame. Esper Control with 7 copies, Mono Red with 7 copies, Turbo Fog with 6 copies at 3.64% of the metagame. Uh, and there is a spreadsheet going around that was but Jarvis U, is that right? Yes. Uh, where they try to essentially like track, it's very hard to track how well individual decks did, and they just, so they try to track win percentages based on, now granted, this is not perfect, but based on their their findings and discussions with people and like trying to track this all out, uh, Turbofog did have the best win rate of any standard deck. Uh, which makes sense because it eats the lunch of Steel Leaf and Red Black. Oh yeah, no Steel Leaf. Dear Leaf you better have a lot of negates and hope that it's enough because, yeah, no, that's not great. Yeah, um, your deck doesn't deal well against Fog. <laughs> yeah, just Fog and just like, uh, it's not your turn. It's not your turn. <laughs> it's not your turn. It's not your turn. It's oh, the... hey, I'm ultimating this fairy because it hasn't been your turn in a while. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. Uh, uh, yeah. But then we had a couple copies of, like, uh, a deck called, uh, Bolus Red, which is a cool sort of dragon take on the deck with Sarkins and, uh, Nickel Bolus Ravager, which is cool. We had some copies of, uh, Approach, Grixis Control, Constrictor, um, and, and beyond that, there's nothing too crazy as we go down. 
Um, I do want to say one of the decks we'll talk about is Green White Cats. There was one copy of that in the tournament, and Green White Cats is great. So I, I, I'll look at the name real quick of who played that, but Green White Cats player, you're insane. <laughs> um, modern metagame. Modern, uh, it looks like it's getting to the point where we sort of know what the metagame looks like. Um, it's been a pretty consistent here for a little bit. Uh, humans, by far, the the number one played archetype, 16% with 27 copies. Bloy Control, though, surprisingly, you know, it, it is now seems to be the favorite past Jeskai Control, and I, I was sort of surprised to see that many copies, 18, almost 11% of the metagame. A lot of copies of Ironworks Combo with 17, and of course we saw that in, um, we saw that deck play in the finals. Um... We had Mono Green Tron, 17 copies. Hollow One, 13 copies. Black Red Vengevine, which was the tur- the the tournament deck du jour, if you will, for yeah, Modern. Yeah, the new deck on the block. Uh, 10 copies. Bant Spirits. and So Bant Spirits had 6 copies, but there was also 3 or 4 copies of Blue White Spirits. So like we had that. And then Modern starts to open up a little more. Jeskai Control, Mardu Pyromancer, Storm. Uh, these all had the 5 or 6 copies. Burn had 4 copies. Um, on down, Shadow had three copies. So uh, we had a couple, again, not a ton of super interesting decks. I will say we had a couple copies of um, Modular Affinity, which is, has been more popular uh, and is a European version of, of Affinity, which is playing um, Hardened Scales. But beyond that, you know, then we just get a lot of one ofs, but uh, nothing super crazy. But yeah, definitely the, um, the, the red black deck is something we'll talk about. And then Legacy, hold on here as I'm opening the link. Just you know, the greatest uh, air right there. Uh, Grixis Control was the number one deck with twenty copies. That's twelve percent. Sneak and Show next was sixteen copies. Eldrazi Stompy had fourteen copies. Death and Taxes was a deck that was predicted to be pretty popular with the bannings. Um, had twelve copies. Team Redelver came back. We saw some Nimble Mongoose. Yep, <laughs> which was great. Swinging in. Mongooses. I think it's geese. I don't know. Uh, Blackwood Reanimator had nine copies. Miracles nine copies. Uh, Blue Black Shadow with nine copies, which was again the, the legacy deck sort of, you know, talk of the town. And Stoneblade, there's your Eldrazi post, Morgan, Mono Red Prison. Um, I have not checked through every single list to see, but I do not think there are any Mog catchers, unfortunately. Rats. Yeah, no Mogs. Um, yeah, so those are those are those major decks. Um, again, we got all of the stand- we got all of the deck lists in general, but really the the meta games are pretty set. So. We'll probably talk about a couple deck lists each. Let's start with the Blue Black Shadow, because Legacy is the first set that pops up on Goldfish. Uh, so if you haven't seen this yet, we've seen it before, and specifically we've seen Josh Uder Layton playing it before, but he, we're, he, he's a list we're going to take a look at because you know that, that was the team that came in second place. Uh, and we got to see a lot of Josh, you know, the sort of Raptor playing this deck, and it was pretty sweet consistently. So this is a version of Death Shadow, that is, um, again, blue-black based in Legacy, and it gets to do some pretty sweet things. It plays Delver Secrets, Death Shadow, Street Wraiths, and some Gurmag Anglers, and then all the fun Legacy cards, so Brainstorm, Ponder, Preordain, uh, Force of Will. This deck gets to play Snuff Out, which is still my favorite thing ever. If you don't know what Snuff Out is, you haven't played enough Cube uh, or Popper, but Snuff Out costs three generic and a black for an instant, destroy a target non-black creature, or if you control a Swamp, you can pay for life and, and destroy a creature, and... Man, paying for life feels really good <laughs> when you are the Death Shadow player. Uh, one of the other things that they also had that was sort of new in this list is they were playing two copies of Reanimate. Yeah, that card's pretty good in uh, in, yeah. in a deck where you want your life total to, to go low, <laughs> uh, and you also play like you know seven and five drop creatures that sometimes you can just reanimate. Yeah, so interestingly enough, you can definitely like do the old turn one like reanimate a uh, Street Wraith. Yeah. Uh, and if you do that off a of fetch and a shock, then you can put yourself to 10 doing it, so you can set up your Death Shadows. But also, they just have a 3-4 with um, with Swamp Walk, which is surprisingly relevant. Yeah. They can't die to Bolt or a Fatal Push. So it is the, a weird line where your deck just becomes a pseudo-bad reanimator. But the nice thing is, like, reanimate is a very nice target, you know, a really nice thing for Death Shadows later in the game. So it scales yeah. real well. Uh, also, it's really good if you are randomly uh, against your reanimator opponent and you get just to take their creature. Yeah, that's also weird. <laughs> they Which, spend their turn one, like, just, like, faithless looting and they pass and you're like... <laughs> or, or even just, like, spend their turn one just by, like, discarding, you know, right, uh, yeah. uh, to hand size. Which I I don't know who did it. I don't know if it was Raptor or not, but I definitely like got to do that to their opponent. They said and it, they got to reanimate a um, 
I don't know if it was a chancellor or not, but something. Oh, oh it was an Iona, I think. Oh God, no! They got to name. They got to reanimate Iona and name Black. <laughs> and we have Black. Uh, you're done now. Thank you. <laughs> Which yes. is hilarious. That's yeah. That's pretty great. So that's a cool setup. And, and honestly, you know, the, I think my favorite thing about this was the sideboard. They were playing three copies of Dread of Night. That card, oh my god, it's a single black for an enchantment that says white creatures get minus one, minus one. That's it. What was really cool is watching a Death and Taxes player beat three of those in play, which was choice. That was nice to see. But it's just a cool one. They also had Throne of Geth. Th Throne of Geth is a two-cost artifact that says tap, sacrifice, and artifact proliferate. These were the only artifacts in the entire list. They literally were there, so you could sack this artifact and take a chalice from one and make it a chalice for two. I don't know if that... Somebody mentioned about, especially against Death and Taxes, they don't know if that was actually better than just, like, Ratchet Bomb, but it does deal with it faster <laughs> than Ratchet Bomb does. So, uh, also the decks that tend to uh, put it on one may not want it on two, and putting it on two is actually a hilarious way to lock them out. So, <laughs> so uh, really cool sideboard tech. Um, it just... It, it hurts It hurts me that... Um, when you take a look at this... Uh, when you take a look at this deck, and you take a look at the price... And you realize that most of the price lies within the two uh, underground, underground seas, seas that it plays. If you subtract the cost of the two underground seas from this deck, it's 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 still expensive, obviously, but it's like on par. It's cheaper than humans. <laughs> it's, it's a build minus two underground seas, which is wild to me. Yeah, that, you could probably get away with playing this deck without the underground seas. You could play the fourth watery grave, and I I don't know, like a sunken whatever it is the, the the bad battle for zendikar one or just like a dark slick shores you you could certainly do it and then you'd really only force of wills and wastelands as a really expensive cards yeah that you wouldn't already probably have for modern which right. is cool uh reanimates are, like, reanimates are 20 bucks but it's not too bad but yeah those underground seas are ooh. but as far as the legacy decks go and you porting what, something you already have a modern this isn't too bad it's close so yeah that was pretty sweet um any other specific legacy decks you want to talk about uh not not that i i you know really uh, explored as far as that is uh, as far as that is concerned fair enough i i do want to mention at least death and taxes and some of the the cool things we've seen on there and a card that saw a ton of play over the weekend which was palace jailer yeah um palace jailer is two generic white white for a two two when it enters the battlefield become you become the monarch and then you exile a creature and opponent controls until you stop being the monarch so it's a fiend hunter but it has nothing to do with the creature still being in play uh and there are a bunch of decks who, who did not have you know either were creatureless or like had few creatures like the death shadow deck for example um where you could just stay the monarch for a while and the, drawing those cards was pretty important so, you know, that's one of those wonky things where, like, adding the Monarch to a two-player game is real crazy. Um, and it uh, was cool to see uh, sort of out there a lot. Like, they, they got a lot of play in the last few rounds. Yeah, uh, it definitely. That, that That's, you know, it, it, not necessarily a, uh, you know, a, a new card to, to suddenly show up. It's definitely been a, um, a, a staple of... A, a staple, rather, it's like a in sideboards or uh, in main decks, it feels like. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, that, that card does does a lot of work in these sort of, uh, uh, you know, mono-white uh, taxes builds. Yeah. Uh, I was also pretty happy, again, I won't talk too much about specific lists, but I was happy to see Stoneblade uh, back as a deck I mentioned that probably had some gaining to do uh, with the bannings. And it was cool to see a lot more Stoneforge Mystics in play in general. Uh, a lot of jites in general, and uh, some some different takes on that deck. So I thought that was again cool cool to see. Yeah. Uh, how about how about modern? Anything strike your eye in modern? Obviously, humans was pretty pretty popular. Definitely. Um, but I I think that was probably an easy call to make. Uh, you know, at, at the pro tour, you definitely want to be proactive uh, in what you're doing, and uh, humans is is probably you know up. One of the best proactive decks that you can have. Uh, we can even see, like, Hollow One, uh, you know, which was piloted by Ben Hull, who, you know, uh, his team won the tournament. Yeah, I you should know. say congratulations to Ben Hull, Alan Wu, and, and Gregory Orange, who, yep. uh, who Team Hot Sauce. T team Hot Sauce Games. So uh, congratulations to, to them for taking down the uh, the Pro Tour, of course. And, but... and beating a pretty crazy team. Yeah. I, mean, I that, that's Beating what is Ben, ben Stark, Stark. Raptor, as we already yeah, mentioned. Yeah, and Martin and, Uza. And Martin Uza, yeah. yeah. So it was, that's... 
that's a tough team to stare down, and 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 it, that came down to the last game, which was pretty crazy. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, but if you want to play a proactive deck in modern humans, is uh pretty much the the baseline uh for that. Uh, I mean, Hollow One is is another one of those decks that can obviously be very uh aggressive. It, it put a lot of power on the board pretty early. Um, but I think the only uh you know deck that we really you know should be talking about modern wise is black red vengevine again it's the uh the the hotless uh ignore my dehumidifier that's <laughs> i was like i don't know what's happening here. it's ignore the robot in the background please um uh, but yeah this is the you know the the new kid on the block uh which i guess it's unfair to say that this is the, the new kid of, of on the block there have been variations of this deck that have existed previously now nah, but this this seems to be the the realest version if that makes sense. Uh, i i completely agree with that let's this, take this... a let's take a look at chewie nakamura's list uh yeah so um you know this deck it relies on uh the combination of things like bridge from below and zero cost creatures like hangerback walker and walking ballista along with you know discard effects like faithless looting uh collective brutality even or grizzly salvage uh which is you know not necessarily a discard effect but definitely gets things into your graveyard along with a new m19 card in stitcher supplier which again you know we've talked about how that card just nets you a lot of velocity into your uh into your graveyard and these all kind of combine to create some really explosive starts that kind of finish with the use of goblin bushwhacker so some things that we we saw uh, or, or have I've seen saw with this deck on on the actual stream where uh, turn one faithless looting, uh, discarding bridge and then playing like two or three uh, zero like two or three hangerback walkers or walking ballistas and getting you know six power on turn one and like that that just ends games if you're just gonna bushwhack them turn two, uh, not not quite but I mean like pretty pretty much no I mean it's it's yeah we saw some games that were over before they even had a chance and also a bunch of games where the opponent had turn one or two interaction with the graveyard i think that was the scariest ones like a lot of, a lot of decks like probably probably the biggest gaining card in modern over cross tournament was leyline of the void it was very very important against ironworks combo against uh even like opposing hollow one decks and against these decks and of course dredge or those kind of things that you see um, and the decks that weren't running that and had things like uh, Rest in Peace or like Now Spellbomb or Relic Progenitus, you could see, you definitely saw games where casting Relic on turn one wasn't fast enough. Mm -hmm. Like, it didn't matter if you popped it. They already had what they needed. And that, I think, is troubling. <laughs> like, like if you, if you can't, you know, like, oh, here's these safety valves for these kind of decks. And it's like, faster than it. Sorry. Yeah, it literally needs something to turn zero to stop me. <laughs> uh, that is uh, pretty scary. I, I do think one of the other cool things, I know Shuhei's list doesn't have it, uh, but like um, like Yuki Ichikawa's does. Uh, one of the other things is a lot of them are playing Greater Gargadons. Oh, wow. Uh, one or two uh, of those as a way to, um, you know, just in case something happens to their creatures, if, if things like, it's really nice to have sitting in suspend if you think your opponent has like Anger of the Gods, for example. Because you can just sack all your creatures, um, and then of course it does some really interesting things with um, uh, like some of the your creatures, like uh, blood gas, for example. Like it, it doesn't expose them to as much removal because you can just sack them in response. And if you hold it with your fetch lens, and it's there, and then your opponent has to worry about how they stack the removal because they've got to stop the hasty nine seven when it comes down. <laughs> they, they most certainly do. Uh, so. Yeah, we we've seen a couple of cards in this deck uh, just explode over the weekend. Yeah, Vengevine. If you are holding on to your Vengevines, they are uh, like very sixty nice. bucks a piece now. They're very nice now. Same uh, bridges, uh, bridge from below is also like you know, thirty bucks a piece now. Yep. So very true. Yeah, it, it, this deck got real expensive real quick, and it already wasn't like cheap <laughs> because because Vengevine never was cheap, but now it's now it's real expensive. Oh, fun fact: this is another deck that plays four black leaf glyphs yeah so uh, please please get us a reprint soon because i want to play more new pyromancer i don't want to pay 200 dollars for black leaf cliffs please watsy current average price of Layla of the void go oh, i'm just gonna guess that looking 34.93 72.94 oh my god okay so add that one to that list oh my god uh, you can still find someone around like 50 uh, i should just said one dollar or Bob. 60 but 
by according to MTG Goldfish for the Magic 2011 Leyline of the Void 72.94 in paper. Oh my gosh, that card is so hard to reprint consistently too. Like Leylines are just yeah, so you, weird. <laughs> you got to print all though. You got to print like a Leyline in every color. I, I guess you don't have to. No, you but... don't have to. You could masters it, but that's just oh man, that's weird. All right, well, please save us, Watsy, please. But uh, I, overall, I think this is a very cool deck, and people keep trying to really, really break things. Uh, and they may have succeeded this time. Let's be honest, they may have succeeded. We already had Hollow One in the format um, as like a deck that plays on a weird axis. The deck that wants to play a bunch of zero cost things on turn one to just like let them die, also weird. But definitely, if you ever see the draws, I have two bridges. This, oh my gosh, you just very dead very quickly. No, thank you. Um, we should also mention uh, KCI was again very uh, Car Car Ironworks was one of the most played decks. And um, definitely got a little bit of a discussion over the weekend about uh, do you need to do something from that deck. Uh, if you watch the Pro Tour consistently, there are a number of games where the the KCI player drew out of what looked to be maybe soft locks to more than that. And like it took the draw of just like drawing like Kirkland Ironworks. Like, a, like yeah. players who were sitting under Leyline of the Voids, for example... Or just any number of cards and just got comboed out anyways. And that was... It's kind of terrifying. It's kind of upsetting. Yeah. Um, and it's not surprising uh, for people to kind of pursue these decks that can get past the hate. Yeah. Like, your hate does not matter with some particular draws that this deck has. And it, I'm just still just going to, to win right through it. And like those, a lot of those decks are are just appealing. So, um, and and to, to be perfectly honest, humans is another one of those decks that kind of functions in that in that in that facet. So, um, yeah. But at the end of the day, no matter how you compare those, and again, you you maybe you could argue that humans does need something done to it. I, I don't think so, mainly because it doesn't take specialized things to interact with creatures. It never does. You know no. what I mean? Like, yes, you've got people having to do some cute things. We saw things like um, John Finkel was playing uh, Fiery Impulses in, um, Storm. in Storm. Why was he playing Fiery Impulses? Because Meddling Mage is naming Lightning Bolt. Yep. Like, <laughs> like that's why. And I think that, that 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 is a better thing to see than anything else. But, I, man, K KCI, like, you, you don't get to play those. Like, I, I, I guess a Braid. We can just start playing all Braids all the time so we can deal with both. But, it, I don't know. It... <sighs> KCI being such a good deck is frustrating because when it finally starts going off, as people said all weekend, it looks a lot like eggs. And I know if you're sitting here frustrated, like, oh, come on, Mike, don't just call for a banning. I'm not saying, I don't even know what card, it, 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 people said like Ancient Stirrings, I don't know. But I do know that when a deck gets that popular, wins through that much hate, and then takes 10 minute turns on its own to win, Watsy tends to take action. So I saw a lot of people on like the various Facebook groups, uh, books, or books, Facebook groups buying into... Uh, this deck, I wouldn't. <laughs> I give it. I give it a banning or two, just like just like a like a banning date or two before I started really yeah, buying uh, it. We will have one of those here coming up soon because it's you By know the way, it's three weeks or something like that. Yeah. Well, I think it's like isn't it? I thought it was always two weeks out of the. Is pro it two tour. weeks? Okay, two weeks yeah. out of the pro tour. Fair enough. Then. Um. So I uh, I would just wait. Yeah, that's like just maybe a little, maybe we'll a little. Slow your on that one, maybe. <laughs> uh, again, we're not. I wouldn't advocate. You know, uh, bands are never fun, but. Uh, I'm I'm on control of that uh, Watsi definitely is, uh, and I mean uh, overall I, I do feel like modern is you know modern is still pretty um, still pretty settled. Um, I I do want to see some more data past the Pro Tour to see how much of an impact Black Red Vengevine is really going to be, you know, taking. And we're going to, you know, I want to see that in paper tournaments mostly. Uh, the, the online data that we see, like, it's going to keep showing up as a, as a deck list that wins, but it's not going to have enough variation between the lists to show up multiple times. Just like, Humans always shows up, but it's, there's never enough variation for it to show up, like, multiple times. For the most part. Um, so I want to see some paper tournaments, some more modern opens or what have you, uh, to, to kind of see where this new uh new cat on the block uh really you know finally lands yeah that, we do fair. already know that ironworks is a bit of a problem it, in, in my opinion yeah it, it's just like again the, those kind of decks that are that the, the win the way they do are always a little rough so yeah. uh let, let's move to standard i i, I want to knock because i mentioned a couple of decks before we get into because i think i think our, we're going to move into a question of the week concerning the turbofog deck and 
Nexus of Fate. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, again, I want to at least mention Bolus Red, which was played by three players, which is a really interesting take on an archetype, uh, which is just sort of red dragons, but they were playing multiple copies of Sarkin and Chandra, the Chandra Torch of Defiance, and then four car- er, carpies. Yep, magic carpies. Four copies of uh, Nickel Bolus, the Ravager, and then Glory Bringer. So the idea was like, you know, essentially they're mono red base deck using some you know nice mana and Sarkin, uh the Fireblood to uh, to get out Nickel Bolus. Which yeah. I think is pretty sweet to see both of those cards seeing some play. Um, let's talk about Dirk Krasto's Green White Cats deck. Heck yeah, this is this is just like, uh, hey, is this cat legal and standard? <laughs> Yeah, Dirk Katzo. Uh, <laughs> Let's play it. Uh, so, I want you to know, this deck is 23 tickets on Magic Online. Heck yeah, <laughs> sign me up. So yeah, this is Cat Tribal. Like, Lean in Vanguard, Sacred Cat, Adorn Pouncer, Johnny's Pride Mate, Pride Sovereign, Lean in War Leader. That's uh, the Hero Blade Hold Cat, by the way. Yeah. Regal Caracal, two Blossoming Defense, four Radiant Destiny, Naming Cat, and some Thopter Rest and Lands. So straightforward tribal deck, just get it in there. M- remember how we have all of these tribes in Ixalan, right? Pirates, no decks. Mm, not, zero. Not zero. Uh, dinosaurs, not nothing. Got nothing. The closest uh, you get is, like, mono green snoppy, but no, still it's no. not. it's not a dinosaur deck. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it plays a dinosaur. That's the biggest Two dinosaur. dinosaurs. I guess it, has, it does have Bronted on, so yeah, my bad. A couple dinosaurs. Um, sure. If you want to call that one dino tribal, that's fine. <laughs> Merfolk? <laughs> no. Vampires? It yeah. had, it, there's like a, there was a token deck running around, but that's yeah. about it. No, the tribe we should be looking at is cats. Cats, meow. Um, in the sideboard, though, that's where this deck gets real spicy. Uh, it's playing a mountain and three copies of Banefire. Yeah. And you're like, but how do you get that, how do you get that one mountain? Well, he, here's the tech. Okay, Blue White Control is the deck that won the standard portion of the tournament. Your Greg, Greg Orange played it masterfully. That deck plays a lot of Settle the Wreckage. Sure does. So this is a deck that's like, I'm going to find my mountain because you're going to tell me to search for it. <laughs> and I'm going to burn you out. And I'm I love it. going to burn your house down. <laughs> With the lemons. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I think that is the most inspired sideboard tech in a standard deck I've Good. seen in such a long time. Just like. Hats off. Like, how do I find this mountain? You'll show me. You'll, You'll lead show the me. way. You'll, yeah. So. I'll find it amongst the wreckage. <laughs> So that was pretty good. We have a lot of uh, copies of Grixis Midrange. Again, these are sort of the Nickel Bolas decks. Um, as I said, Red Black Aggro was the number one played deck by a huge margin. But st- still, if Stompy did have some some copies. Uh, it, it, but here's the thing: Standard is th- this is the the biggest the standard is going to be, and we're at the we're just at the tail end. Yeah, we're of at it. the end. We're at the end. Uh, and like Red Black Aggro has shown itself to be the the what is likely the best and most versatile. Uh, deck that is around again it's another proactive strategy and pros want to play something proactive uh typically with um in, in the pro tour it, it just it has shown itself to be the best strategy um in um a lot of different tournaments and um uh, i think it was definitely the deck to beat so people would just rather play the deck to beat and then try experimenting and i don't blame them it just uh kind of is what it is but you know, once rotation happens, we will be losing a lot of cards that are played within Red Black Aggro. We're going to be losing, you know, Kaladesh block. And I think, like, that is a real huge impactor to, you know, this deck, this this archetype. So, I, I agree, like, uh, Standard is, is on, on its way out. And it's unfortunate that we are, uh, you know, that we're, we're actually going to be having, like, Standard GPs happening over the weekend. Because I think, like, I don't care. I guess I guess I don't care. Um, I, I, maybe it'll be surprising, but um, and it, it is a GP, so that's going to be different than a, than a pro tour, and especially a team pro tour. So we still have the opportunity to have some fun decks, you know, show up at the top eight or even win the tournament. Um, you know, stuff like yeah, mono black zombies. That was that people did play here at the pro tour. Um, so there, there's still a lot of like fun and interesting gems here among the sea of red black aggro. Um, <laughs> But I think this is a good, you know, kind of time to transition into sort of the elephant in the in the room, which was Bant Turbo Fog. So, uh, if you're not familiar, you know, the the Turbo Fog strategy basically relies on there being a a, a critical amount of fogs uh, within the um, within the format to allow a, a deck to exist that kind of. Uh, for lack of a better term, does nothing <laughs> until it does all the things and you lose. Uh, uh, and there were six players, I believe, six or seven, one, two, three, six players. four, five, six players, including uh, 
uh, David Williams, uh, Wing Chun Yam, uh, Li Shitian, uh, Raphael Levy. Uh, you know, these are, uh, you know, notable uh, magic players. These are, you know, people that have uh, been invited to the Silver Showcase, that have won Pro Tours. That are great cooks. That are fantastic chefs in their own right uh, that, that chose to play this deck. Now, you might say, like, oh, who cares about Turbo Fog? Who cares about, you know, this sort of, like, you know, Pillow 40-esque sort of uh, deck that people... So, some people love playing these kind of decks, sure. you know? This is the first time, you know, Turbo Fog is not a new term, you know? This is, like, <laughs> an archetype within itself. Um, why talk about it? Uh, we're talking about it because it, it is an archetype that, uh, according to that, that, that spreadsheet that Jarvis Hugh shared, was the best performing deck, but also, uh, it plays for Nexus of Fate. Now, Nexus of Fate, if you don't know, is the buy box promo that we, we've talked about previously uh, on this cast, probably to, to many people's, like, uh, you know, tiredness. Also, we're giving two away, which we, now that we're back from Gen Con, we will be setting up yeah. those specific things. Ding, by the way. And yes, we're about to complain about Nexus of Fate. And yes, we're also going to try and profit off you, the listener, by giving you <laughs> Nexus of Fate. Is that hypocritical? 100% deal with it. <laughs> it's free. This is capitalism. And if you don't want it, guess what? You don't have to sign up for the giveaway. Uh, unless you're on Patreon, you're already signed up. Sorry. <laughs> I guess you could, on principle, just say, no, I don't want this. <laughs> well, don't, because we want your money. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a really good way to talk about it. <laughs> Please, support us on Patreon. We want it. We want. We need it. It's, Please. It's, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, um, I think that... Um, us and a lot of people are under the assumption that these the these buy box promos, first of all, when they announced, many people said they were bad. And e even if you, hey, I did, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if uh, people, you know, if you took a look at Fire Song and Sunspeaker, you'd be like, okay, you know, this card isn't going to break standard. You know, it's not it's not going to see play. You know, uh, I, I know Mike, you wanted it because you wanted to play Brawl with it, mm -hmm. and that absolutely makes sense. And it makes sense for people who want to play like actual Commander with it and, and have it in their in their decks. It's a, it's a pretty unique card that does some pretty unique things. It, it, it's still expensive, you know, comparatively to if it was just like a regular Mythic rare within the set. You know, and it's it is rare. It, it, it is expensive due to its. You know, what I like to refer to as its ultra mythic rarity. <laughs> um, now, when you combine that with something like Nexus of Fate, uh, you combine that ultra mythic rarity with actual playability. Even even if this deck ends up being like tier two or or tier three, you know, something something not tier one, not necessarily like everywhere, and you have to play it, or you're not going to win your, your tournament. Even the slightest bit of actual, like, standard demand for this card will raise the price of it unquestionably, like, to an exorbitant amount, which is already done. This is this is still hovering around a $35 to $40 card. It was $20 last week. And it, it was $20 last week. Well, well, and also, even before the Pro Tour happened, rumors of this deck were around. Magic Online, you had a real issue getting the card because it only got released in Treasure Chests. And the Treasure Chest drop rate was very, very low. Now, the nice thing they could do with Magic Online is, hey, they could increase that drop rate, uh, which they, they said that they, they are going to be doing. Um, and, the, and the card today on Magic Online is still, you know, like forty a, tickets. Yeah, forty, you know, you know, tickets. Because I know that um, Saffron Olive uh, was had to acquire some for his stream and said he's, you know, still paid forty dollars as opposed to the sixty dollars <laughs> that it once was. So, I, I've seen so many bad takes. So many people that were champions of this that are, are are now saying like oh well this is a problem but the buy box thing that that's not the problem it's the card and you have to stop giving wizards of the coast the benefit of the doubt uh, at this point in time <laughs> they have so quickly messed this up so quickly released a card that is clearly standard playable uh, that will have a demand for it by standard players, whether it, it be the highest demand or just the like tier two deck demand that will cause this card to be exorbitantly expensive. And that isn't fair to your player base because you, Wizards of the Coast, are purposefully limiting access to this card. And that is messed up. <laughs> that is so messed up. Uh, and I, I just, I, I'm tired of seeing people on Twitter saying like the, the, just the most 
just the worst things like oh people it, you know this card's forty dollars because that's what people are going to pay for it this card's forty dollars because it has a low demand i mean a low supply in, in a in a high demand at this point in time that would probably tail off to a medium demand uh, to a low demand as time goes on but it doesn't matter because if this card was a mythic in the set and it performed this well and was in a two tier two tier three deck something like part the water veil then we see the maximum price of that card being around five or six dollars and this is a card that's currently worth 40 and even if it had it it went back to its 20 dollars starting price at that point in time you're still paying four times as more for a, a card uh, and, and I understand that, you know, Battle for Zendikar had Expeditions in it. So it was open way more. Fine. This card should maybe be $10 at most to, to, to kind of counteract the fact that M19 isn't going to be open as nearly as much as Battle was. But instead, it's $40 because, you know, uh, Wizard of the Coast thought that putting out more uh, exclusive, you know, uh, promos uh, that it can only, can only be open, it can only be obtained by buying boxes was a great idea now there's a ton of people that have you know been in support of this because they're employed and i understand like it, they can they, they can step away from that and have their own opinions and their opinions don't necessarily reflect those of the store but if you do work for a store and you have these opinions i'm gonna tell you right up front it does not look like you're an advocate for the player uh, especially, you know, be honest. One of the, one of the people we're talking about here is is a fairly prominent member of the, the Magic community who Morgan's had some some back and forth with now on Twitter. Um, person doesn't even like these people are suggesting it's good for local game stores. Yet these people aren't representing local game stores. They're representing the stores who are making money off of players by selling these cards for forty dollars. It's there's so many things wrong with this whole situation and, and those same people that Morgan's talking about have been like very condescending. Um, you know, the, I will say though, the one that we were talking about, it, it's Evan Irwin. I was being very honest. I guess who it is. Um, you know, um, uh, Stefan Olm called him out for, uh, for called him out for moving the goalposts essentially about what was, and, he, and he, he admitted that he, he was moving the goalposts, which I think is an important thing to see. Cause before it was, well, let it be a problem before you, you make a big deal about it. But now, to, you know, almost it was one one away from top fouring the pro tour, which I think like honestly, if you're a defender of this card, you are super lucky that one slot was a difference because had it been on camera on a Sunday on the pro tour, forty dollars not Sky, where we're at. Sky's the limit. Yeah, man. it's like not sky's even close. The limit. So you're you're lucky you just missed on. But that. But to be fair, it, you know, would it been on the camera? It would have been a, a proxy. <laughs> okay, the second the second issue is so beyond the card itself and the fact that again we're pretending like the core set is the set we teach new players on. The core set is how we do these things, we simplify it and all this stuff, and then you can go to your local game store as a new player, but you didn't get to buy a box because you're a new player and an opponent casts a card on you that you can't get. You can't open it in a pack, you can't ask the store for it, you could you have to go drop 40, 50 bucks on it. That is not good. Like it just isn't. And if it wasn't if it wasn't standard legal. I wouldn't care at all. Yeah. You know, that could be the fix tomorrow, right? But instead, you you decide we're going to let it be standard legal, but make it, you know, very rare to get. Plus, only be in foil. So going back to Morgan's joke about seeing the proxy, they were literally proxied at the Pro Tour because you were marking your deck with your foil copies of it, much like we had with the Commander card uh, yeah. the last time. And people were concerned about, you know, foils tend to warp, so they didn't want to take the risk. No, and, and like, why would you? All of these things are ridiculous, but the people on Twitter, like like Irwin and a number of people who are saying, well, this is all reactionary. This It isn't reactionary. You know why? Because you can go back and listen to Morgan and I two, three, four months ago when this, the first time it happened with Dominaria and then when they announced that it was going to be a consistent thing, telling you that this is a problem. You can go back and look at Mark Rosewater's Tumblr and pull out the one from from the, 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 promo, the Xbox promos from 2013 and him saying that promos like this are bad because you make this exclusive supply for it. it this, the, the, he was trying to separate them from the dragon, the Nalanthi dragon. Yeah, yeah. Like you have you have Watsi itself saying this is not a good thing. You have players like like ourselves saying like no, like this is going they're going to be a mistake. And then after you know now they're saying well you're just being reactionary. No, we predicted this. Like we predicted it when we saw Nexus of Fate. We predicted it when we saw Fire Song and and, and Sunspeaker. Like this is ridiculous. And I and I. Morgan Morgan spent the good part of his day today being a Twitter warrior, which I which I I, I appreciate. But it, I just I don't know how you can sit there and be smug and just be like, oh well, 
you guys aren't just seeing the big picture. No, I don't think you're seeing the actual picture. Like, forget big picture. If you want, if this helped, again, if it's a revenue stream that helps local game stores, that's fine. I bought boxes, not because of this, but I did support my local game store. There's a lot of things you could put in that box, and I would I would go buy more than I buy any of these cards. Apparently, none of those options work though. That that's what people on Twitter said. No other yeah, option works. No option. This is works. the only one that's worked. Correct. Right. Apparently. Um, and at the end of the day, like, I, you know, I, I care very much about my local game store. But if these people on Twitter cared as much about the local game stores, they they'd stop being the corporation that sells cheaper boxes than the local game store like yeah that's, weird. that's the funniest thing in the world to me it's like no you don't understand how this local game store but use this coupon on cool you know, whatever to go get an 80 dollars box and it's like well if i get an 80 dollars box i that's that's better price than my local game store can yeah exactly oh wait it's almost like your argument holds no ground because you have what are you standing on at this point like you literally undercut local game stores that is your d job and design to stay afloat so don't tell me don't come to me on high suggesting that you know what's about this the best part too is these are people who don't work for watsi who are citing imaginary numbers like where where are they where are the numbers at to tell me all these things it is it is crazy and and, and like you can say like well what are you citing i i'm citing 24 copies of showing up in the pro tour and almost almost top fouring yeah. That's what I'm citing. Uh, I'm too. citing results. The I'm, card card's good. Go look at MTG stocks and you can see the line that draws up of how much more expensive this card has become in the last two weeks. Right. And there's n here you know, you, you may mention this already, but it will say it very clearly. If that card doesn't see any it, we don't see it this weekend, it's not going back below thirty. No, because there's still there's still people that like that want to play that deck just because the, the this is the thing that that, that blows my mind that, that people have said like oh we'll just like if you don't want to buy it for forty dollars just don't buy it like people only buying it for forty dollars because that's you know that's, that's literally that's the every price. product ever uh, correct. that's still the most that's the hottest take I've ever heard well it's only costs as much as people are willing to pay for it yeah that's economics what? I don't yeah. know what to tell like, you like literally I just want, like I don't know if like I'm just like bruh <laughs> like what yeah yeah I know I'm aware uh. Even, even you know, the size amount of demand on this card is going to be able to uh, allow, you know, single sellers to use that to sell it for an exorbitant price. Look at Fire Song and Sunspeaker, a card that literally has no demand, still $15 for some reason. Does it, it like, you gotta understand, like, the artificial, uh, so, you know, shortage of supply that WotC creates with this card makes them be able, makes, you know, card sellers to kind of racketeer it a little bit uh to be perfectly honest and now that they see there's blood in the water that this card has results and that even if you know uh, you know people want to uh you know experiment with it and play with it fire song and sunspeaker is three dollars I, I okay just wanted, I just uh, sorry say, sorry it was it was fifteen dollars it was, was, it. It, was it, it was for a while for the, for the longest time it and, has no demand so it, yeah and, and you know maybe this is the trajectory for uh, next to fate maybe you know once rotation happens everything kind of just falls off and, the, see, and the wheels fall the, off but I that's think, so long I, I i don't again i i have i have an issue with that saying like so like i can go buy some 30 dollar copies of nexus of fate right now it's it's dipped a little bit back down as people who are sitting on copies are selling a bunch of copies right but the problem here is that once you already have these results like this card is going to be standard legal for another almost two years at this point right or is it just a year and a half i guess it's a core set so it, it goes the next year i have to look at the rotation model but like there's a lot more time for it to hit again there's a lot more time for there to be problems with this it's just such a weird thing and like everyone everyone who was pro these promos said it'll you know you know to give them time for this but they messed up on the second one like they messed up on the second one what's the third one gonna look like it's either going to go back to being so bad that it's Fire Song and Sunspeaker, no one cares at all. And I got to tell you, I still, I still will never buy that Fire Song and Sunspeaker sold all those Dominaria boxes. Like, it, it's you know, next to Fate, at least you can give me the argument that it pre-ordered for enough that it felt like value to buy the box. It felt like you were getting like a, um, like an invention maybe. But I, I just, I, I don't, I don't understand. So like I. It is so it is so wild to me just like which yeah. people like no this is a good thing and it's like but I and like most of these people you can go back and like it was already thinking, you can go back to all the different times they said this is bad but for some reason this exact scenario everyone's being reactionary and if you like Nexus of Fate that's fine you like Nexus of Fate but at some point like we now have proof that that card and these promos 
have the ch- have the chance to be super close to too good. They're only in foil, which makes it hard to play in tournaments. They confuse and are frustrating for new players who have no chance to get them out of that one. Guess what? You have to have four to play this deck. Mm-hmm. You can't just play the one. You got to have the four because that's the point of the deck. Like it is. Heck, we were talking about it before as being a one of them blue white control. And we thought that would be enough to spike it, let alone a four of any deck. Like this is just so weird to me. Make them not standard legal, or again, try out. Go back to the promos we had before, where you had a bio box promo and got a good card. But make them good cards. Make them mythics. Like yeah. again, like give me an old art Nicobola the Ravager, and I'm more excited to buy that box of the core set, anyways. But then I can look at a new player and say. Well, yeah, you you can't have this one. This is I got this for doing this, but you can open these cards. Yeah. You can still play this card. And um, I I got arguments today that hey, no one's forced to play this deck. No one's forced to play this card. Doesn't mean people don't want to. Yeah, it's so weird to just be like like. So uh, uh, Matt Sperling had a good article uh, about Nexus of Fate, and and again I, I've said on here before, that Matt Sperling is not a person I always look to for rational. Uh, no, he's he's hit or miss, and a lot of times he's more miss than me. But he's released a couple of things that have been very hit, which yeah. makes me worried. Uh, but he said a couple of things that I thought were good takes. One, he flat out said that like he's like there are people who are going to tell you to not complain about this. Don't listen to them. That's illogical. Like this is the way that Watsy hears back from you. So if you let, if you let people who aren't Watsy employees, but who are making money on this shout you down, then there's something fishy there. But two, he mentioned, he's like, don't be that person who, who, because like, for example, you have your copies or you're making money off your copies. Then you, he described it as the metaphor was like pulling the, the drawbridge for the moat back behind you. And like, now you're part of the group who's like, no, this is very good. I have these. I, I I already own them or I've made money off of them. Like, don't like, don't become part of an in group that now decides that like, well, yeah, you're right. People don't have to play this deck. I mean, I can, but don't worry about like you, like, if you do that, then like you, you're just gonna sit there and be upset that when you get burned, when you're the one who all of a sudden somebody pulled that up for you, you're like, but I want to get across the moat. They're like, oh no, sorry, actually, yeah, not for you this time. Yeah, there's this weird picture of uh, Eifero on Twitter these days who just has, shows him with a you know big old pile of Nexus of Fates. So I don't know how he got that insider information about Nexus Fate being potentially good, maybe from his friend David Williams. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know, there's that. But but what's fine? I'm not gonna judge a man for making a quick buck. But um, no, because just as often as that happens, you also have a picture of of like Brian Kilbert taking a Scrooge McDuck bath with Daybreak Raider. So. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> um, but I, you know, we wanted to be constructive with our feedback, and uh, I, I've seen some good uh, again things that have been already mentioned. Like uh, the, uh, buy box promos are fine. Print them in the sets. Like period. And end of story. Make them good. You have to make them them good. You can't just like, you can't just sell exclusivity. Like that's not fair to a, a collectible card game. That's not necessarily fair to something to say like we are 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 going to like yeah we we're, we're going to um make you want to buy a, a box at your local game store because of ex- exclusivity because you'll have people that genuinely want the card you'll have people that are buying the car buying boxes to spec on the card uh that you know, hopefully it, it something does happen to it where it does spike and i can turn around and sell it for 40 dollars and make nearly half my box back uh or you have people that just you know don't care <laughs> and are buying boxes because they can get it early or the set is good uh, which apparently, it, you know, a set being good has no, no influence on how many boxes you sell. Did you know that? I, that's what I've heard. Grayson. That's what Evan Ir- Irwin said today. So uh, I, apparently Watts just make garbage sets because who cares? Yeah. It doesn't matter. You're not going to sell any more boxes if it's all bad or all good. Who cares? Don't even try. Just <laughs> stop trying. Looks back at the multiple boxes of Dominari I bought. And then the zero boxes I bought for a decade before that. Yeah, it checks out. Yeah, yeah, clearly this is... uh, You bought those boxes for Fire of Song and Sunspeaker. Both of them. Yeah. (laughs) That really heavily influenced it. I... uh, So, I I, I truthfully think if Wizards wants to fix this, guess what? Print good mythics as your buy box promo. Make them exclusive to stores. Uh, and make make cards that are openable in packs. And uh, I I bet you if you uh, if you start making planeswalkers 
as the uh as the, the the buy box promos guess what people people like planeswalkers even if they aren't like that good people still like planeswalkers uh it, it, it so do that like come on it's not hard. Don't don't make stupid exclusive cards that are going to be forty dollars for no reason, other than there isn't enough supply to go around. So, it'd be smart about it. Don't don't be dumb. You can still support your local game store uh, by by doing this, uh, and everyone comes out happy. Uh, all in all, and that that would be my suggestion. Yeah. Uh, because guess what? This is the same problem that happened with F and M promos, right? Because uh, people, you know, people didn't want F and M promos to go away. We didn't want tokens. We just wanted good cards. It, it's it's the same for any amount of promos. Like think think about like when I'm trying to think about when I got back into the game for the first time or for the second. I guess back into the second time. I like so I got back in during it was the first pre-release I got to do when I came back to the game was Scars of Mirrodin, right? Um, or was uh, Mirrodin Besieged? I'm sorry. And bef- like think about the promos you had for like pre-release promos or like. A release promos you had just before that you had Emrakul, uh, you had Worm Coil Engine. Yeah, you know what I mean. You had things like uh, like think about the Planeswalkers that were promos, like a Johnny Vengeant. You know what I mean. Like you had promos that were given out to players that were exciting. They were like, whoa, like this set can do this. This is cool. And then for some reason they uh, they just like turned on their heel and decided, you know, no more mythics for these. No more really good cards. And they just kept getting worse and worse. And worse, and, and like, and that's not just buy a box promos. It's just like all like random promos in general. Like now you get like the promo for like the first draft night of a, of a set release, and it's literally trash. It's constantly trash. I do not know why they make them, and I, I think it's it's frustrating when you see that on every level where it's like, well, the only place we're going to make a good promo is one that's probably too good for to be what it is. It's an exclusive card. It's going to be legal in these formats and these things. And it's like, yeah, but you could have just like made it like a Karn with a different art. You know what I mean? Or like, like do something like that that makes, I, I, like I think about the Ugin, you know what I mean? That like you had in the Fate Reforged packs, right? Like you had this alternate art, non-foil Ugin that was very, very cool. I don't want to say you give one of those to every player, but of course like you're not giving every player. You're only giving out to the X, first X to buy a box. But I think those kind of things would drive sales. Like I, I guess I would have a hard time believing that wouldn't drive sales to me. Like they have never, as we've mentioned a couple of times, they've never tried to do that. They have never tried that hard to sell a box uh, with, with a card like that. And I, I think they just could. And it, it, it's frustrating that they have to try and go this route where they have, like, not to sit there and rant a little bit, but Morgan, how much time do you think they actually devote when, they, when they're when they in Future Future League or they're in you know Play Design? How much time can they really test these buy a box cards? Clearly not enough. I mean, for sure. But I mean, like, I, I just I wonder, like, when do they get introduced into the play design process? When, when, like, are those, you can't tell me that they're devoting as much time to that, that card as they are to anything else. You know what I mean? Like, cause it's not really in the set. So they probably don't see it as a threat when it first comes out. So if it passes that first check, uh, I don't know. I don't even know where to go anymore. This is just frustrating. Like I, I make it not standard legal and I stop caring. Like, I think that's it as far as, far as where I'm at. Like, yeah. Then, then let it be a commander thing or, or a brawl thing or whatever it is. Like, you know, Fire Song and Sunspeaker was definitely there as a brawl thing. Like, hey, we're going to do this new format. Here's this legend who is two Hurlum Minotaurs. Get it? That's fun. And I and I agree. That was fun. Next is the Fate, though, like, has, has a chance to be a very, very good standard deck. And if you look at that standard deck, not a lot of it rotates. Yeah, and it's not going to take a lot of, like, it's not going to take much more to continue to make that card like tacitly playable so it's just like we have this 40 dollar like uh, mythic and it's again only 40 dollars because the supply is low right i don't want to hear any arguments saying like it's 40 dollars because that's what people are going to pay for it no uh, people are going to pay for it because they want to play it right. like that is why they're paying for it because they don't have any other options all right uh they they they, they want to play this deck and that you can't blame them for wanting that. You can't just say like, oh, "I want to play this deck," but I'm just, you know what? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait because like I'm not gonna pay forty dollars for that. Like, that's not fair. Like, you're just denying people like the opportunity to play Magic the way they want to play it because you decided to not supply this card properly. And I also heard arguments where it's like, well, you know, Nicobolus, like he's forty dollars. Nicobolus is the most powerful card in M nineteen. It's the easiest bet to make in M nineteen as being like playable. Yeah, and for you, the entire time is in standard. If you want them, you can open packs. Yeah, you can go draft. 
You can go buy a box and get it. You can't go buy a box now and get Nexus of Fate. You can nope. go buy a box and probably get a, a Nicol Bolas. Like, that argument holds no water because if you want more of them and you want that price to go down, you just open packs. You can't do it for Nexus of Fate. Uh, all right, I'm done. I'm done. We have to be done. I can't. <laughs> That's so stupid. It's such a stupid argument. It's bad. It's a, it's a bad take. Don't don't make those takes. Uh, this is a, a, a warning to, to all you guys out there. Like, uh, <laughs> just stop. This is, this is bad. Um... And Watsi has multiple avenues to fix it, and they probably won't. Let's yeah, be real. Fair. Let's be real. They probably won't. Uh, if uh, you disagree with this, though, direct it only at Morgan. I do not have yeah, the time or energy to fight come on. you on Twitter. Let's do it. Let's spar. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready. I don't have the best arguments, but I'm angry. So let's figure it out. <laughs> at your instep or the... at more War Marshall. Ignore <laughs> at Big Tears. Not, not for me. It's the typical American argument. Again, don't have good arguments, but I'm angry. Let's do this. <laughs> I'm, I'm angry, and I'm ready to, to punch something. Um... So that's uh that that's what we're uh we will uh leave off for uh for this evening for for tonight and we'll uh look towards the uh the future as it were. So uh we have uh according to our show notes we have Grand Prick <laughs> Orlando. Which, oh, well, that makes sense. I mean, it's Florida. <laughs> uh, P R I C. Uh, Grand Prix uh, that, that Orlando. Is a, that is a fan auto correct thing and I apologize. And then we have uh, Grand Prix Brussels as well. And they're both standard and I hope that Bant next to Fate top eights both of those <laughs> just tournaments. Just takes them both down. Or just wins both of them. <laughs> just so I can like it's just so I can oh be God. fully powered. It's like Morgan's over here flexing. I, <laughs> just so uh, I can I'm be actually, like I, I apologize. Let me check real quick because Star City might have an event too. I just forgot to look. Alright. Well, so. what's well, I'll allow him to get that, but um, uh, uh, nope, not this weekend. Okay, so um, uh, I do want to, of course, uh, talk about uh, our giveaway for uh, Nexus of Fates because guess what? I'm too angry to own them. I'm too angry to own them. <laughs> Going out of business just, sale, just on sheer principle. I just need to get them away from me. They're not in my home, they're in Mike's home. They're, which they're is my probably home. Fun a good fact, thing. I had to put them under a heavy book, have them double sleeved. I noticed that they started to... T I was like, already? Of course you have to be proxied. So don't worry, they're getting nice and flat. Uh, uh, and of course, one of those giveaways is going to be on... Uh, I'm going to uh, tweet out the link tomorrow. Uh, I get, uh, Today, when you're hearing this. <laughs> it's going to be tomorrow for me. But today, when you're hearing this, that's <laughs> In when... In the future, but it could also be now. <laughs> when I'm going to post the link for it. We have... Uh... The future is now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to be a, a, a Google uh, um, a Google form that you fill out. Uh, so it's going to be real simple and easy. Uh, something with it, you will need a Google account to to enter, and that is just so that only you, we get one entry per person, which I guess is actually limited by your Google account. So hey, don't make a bunch of Google accounts and enter into this. Uh, we'll be checking, and don't think that we won't. Um, uh, that's going to be tweeted out and um, uh, on our Twitter. And then, of course, the other contest is going to be uh, via Patreon. Uh, so if you are a member of a Patreon at any level, um, you are entered into this contest to win an Nexus of Fate. So we're giving away two. One's going to be uh, for everyone, and one's going to be exclusive to our Patreon uh, donors. Uh, and if you are interested in joining that uh, exclusive club, you can go to patreon.com slash at your end step and sign right up. Um but that's going to be, again, everything for, for us for this week. Uh, if you um, are listening to us via iTunes uh, or your Apple podcast application, you can uh, definitely go ahead and leave us a review uh, or give us a rating. It really helps with uh, visibility and uh, gets more listeners to the show. If you're listening to us via MTG Cast, feel free to check out some of the other lovely Magic the Gathering podcasts they have available on there. If you want to reach out to us, we do have a few ways you can do so. Um, you can reach out to us on uh, Twitter. It's just at your end step, and then you can add us. It's uh, really cool when you do it because then it makes at your end step. Um, we also have an email address at your end step at gmail.com. Uh, and I'm working on getting a, a just an at your end step domain. I, I started that process today so we can actually have like, you know, mail at at your end step. Oh, nice. That's nice. Uh, and then we also, uh, of course, have uh, our Facebook, uh, which is just uh, facebook.com slash at your end step uh, and you can reach out to us on there if you have any questions or concerns so plenty of ways to uh, get in contact with us uh and um yeah like i said that's gonna be uh it for this very fiery episode of at your end step we'll be back next week and you uh folks have a great one